Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, a humble human on a mission, here to help you both look and feel your best. In today's episode, we're going to be talking all about our bodies, our fascia, movement, that's fun, and also what our posture can actually say about us and what we can do to improve upon that. We have a returning guest here, Anna Ray. She's a lot of fun. And for the past 25 years, Anna Ray has delved deep into liberating and empowering relationships with fascia so that as many people as possible can invest in their health, restore their vitality, and heal themselves with the proprietary tools she has created. As the founder, CEO, and educator of GST Body, Anna has spoken about holistic body care through fascia around the world. Partnered with top athletes, surgeons, physicians, and celebrities, Anne has been featured in various publications from Shape to Elle, Nat a Porter to the Wall Street Journal. And you can learn more about Anna Ray over at Anna Ray, R A H E dot com. And she has an upcoming retreat in Colorado in August. So if you are in the area, definitely reach out to her and uh, let's get our fashion moving. Anna, welcome to the show. Let's kick things off with the question that I love to ask. What is radiance to you? Thank you for having me, Rachel. It's really nice to be here. Um, What is radiance to me is an internal lightness of being, both a luminosity, light, and also weight, lightness of weight. And so when we kind of like step into our radiance, we're really living into who we are authentically um, and with purpose and with um, clarity. Yeah, that's beautiful. Purpose, clarity, luminosity, a hundred percent. And this all comes through having a clear vessel, a clear body, mind, spirit, and energy, and then making sure all of your systems are operating in a specific way so that you have more of that a luminosity to you that comes through your skin by being healthy and the fascia is just such an incredible thing to dive into. We did a previous episode. If you haven't listened to that previous episode with Anna and I go back and listen to that because we dive deep into, you know, what is the fascia, why it's so important. So for this one, it's kind of an extension to that episode on what is the fascia, why is it vital for our skin's radiance and body's physical wellness? Tell us how through smoothing out our fascia, you know, we can see changes with cellulite through movement. We can move things around like stagnant lymph, which makes us look puffy. Tell us just for listeners here that maybe didn't catch the other episode. What is fascia? Okay. Fascia is, um, a connective tissue that is everywhere in your body. Um, there's different types of fascial organs, that are kind of like your heart and your liver, but they're not massed organs, they're layered organs, and they wrap around and into and through every other body system. So all of a sudden fascia becomes an entire body system called the connective tissue system. And it has all these influences on almost every other system, not almost on every other body system. And the way to picture fascia is kind of like this gooey spider web gel that's like a net. And these nets are organized in layers, but like um, little tubes. And so when we start looking at the things you brought up, cellulite and um, lymphatics, and it it taps into so many things, but those two things that you bring up, really fascia, when it gets dry, ossified, when those fibers are rigid and there's too much tension and pressure in them, it actually will vice other tissues like your muscle tissues, your adipose tissues, and create asymmetry in the linings and the layering of these tissues. And because everything venerates through, which just means a fancy word for running through, think about like your nerves, your lymph, your um, blood vessels, your veins, everything lays inside of this fascia. And so I like to kind of create a picture for people to understand it almost like um, an old fifties gel, jello bowl, where you have fruit floating in it, all of your 
body parts, muscles, bones, organs lay inside of this fascia like a, like fruit in a jello bowl. And if your jello is completely rigid and hard and dehydrated, then your fruit is like stuck and rigid and unable to move and have a uh, flow. And so that causes huge amounts of stress on the body. The body's not able to create movement. And the number one thing that the body needs 100% of the time is movement. And we usually think of movement only as exercise and fitness, but movement starts really deep in the cellular level of your body where cells actually have to move in order to proliferate and to recreate and to restore and remodel your body systems and keep you healthy. And so we like to kind of expand for people or fascia likes to expand for, for people the idea of movement beyond exercise and fitness to a very internal, intrinsic um, experience that is essential to support the rest of the um, outer movement that we see as fitness, but it starts much deeper. It's almost like equivalent to, you know, cosmeceuticals and being able to take internal vitamins for your skin versus just layering on your, you know, superficial fascia really wants you to move on the inside. Motion is kind of lotion for fascia and it creates a completely different um, level of health inside when your fascia is healthy. Mm -hmm. I love all those uh, different layers, no pun intended, that you shared about fascia and why it's so important. And a couple of things for everybody, just kind of reminders here is the fascia have their own mitochondria. So we definitely want to be kicking up our mitochondrial output for energy for the cells so that our fascia can provide the movement and the structure and the support and the transmission of different molecules and ions to tell the body to do different things. We're bioenergetic beings. And this is a, a great uh, reminder. Uh, I'm a huge fan of taking NAD to support my mitochondrial function. And Qualia makes an excellent NAD product. You can get that over at qualia.com forward slash radiance and use code radiance on your next order of NAD because this declines as we age. Our skin quality, we lose elastin, we lose collagen, and we definitely lose NAD, which is a precursor that our mitochondria needs to make cellular ATP. That's why I'm such a huge fan of giving Qualia's NAD product a shout out. I want to talk about fitness for a moment. And, you know, I used to eat salads for every meal. I used to work with a personal trainer three times a week. I would glute bridge 325 pounds. I would deadlift 170 pounds, very strong. But when I look back on the way my body looked, I was more puffy, right? I was, you know, eating the kale, I was eating the quinoa, all the foods that were anti-nutrient foods and inflammatory until I took Viome and started to test and guess how I ate and went actually more to high protein, a little bit more carnivore. I don't do anything in any extreme. But that made a huge difference for me in my body composition because talking about the fascia of the body, we have to talk about body composition as well. We want to be svelte. We want to look fit. We want to have good muscle definition. So when I switched to eating more protein and doing things like swimming and pickleball, I do want to talk about jujitsu because of the squeezing of the body, like when you're doing different movements and, you know, I have someone's legs wrapped around my midsection on my organs, you have to flex your abs really tight. And sometimes if I'm in a, you know, more intense jujitsu rolling session, um, you know, I can have a little bit of soreness in, in my stomach area, but then a couple of days later I look shredded with my abs. And I think it's because that compression on the fascia and the organs and the space between is just allowed, you know, some of that stagnant fluid to, to move away. What's, what's your take on that for jujitsu, for holds along the midsection, for compression on the midsection, for allowing for drainage of essentially excess stuff to move? So I like what you said earlier that nothing should be done in extreme and fascia is a body system that literally is teaching and screaming for moderation in all things, not too much, not too little right down the middle. So the question is a little bit tricky about compression because mostly we live very compressed lives. 
our state of being is very retracted and into ourselves and holding and holding. And it's true that fascia needs compression. It's a type of stretching. But if all you do is compress, then you are actually vicing the ability for fascia to stretch and flow. So when I work with people in the very beginning, the most important thing is to actually un De or decompress through this active called traction to be able to pull the fibers apart. Fascia, let me go back and say this real quickly. Fascia is like tubes, okay? It's made of fibers, but they are organized in tubal structures. And so a tube being also that fascia is 70% water, only 30% fiber, it works on the uh, science of fluid dynamics. It's a totally different physics than what mo most people think of when they think of movement. It's not pulleys and levers of the muscles. It's like these pumps excuse me, pumps and the most basic elemental mechanics of a fluid dynamic is a syringe, like hydraulics, right? And so the reason I'm going to, I'm going to get back to your compression question, but your fascia, like a tube acts like a hydraulic syringe where you push the syringe through and it moves fluid and then you pull the syringe back and it draws fluid in and you push and you pull and you push and you pull and this is the mechanism that fascia uses to be able to stay hydrated fibers individuated getting glide across those fibers so compression is really really good but it's only one side of that mechanical equation. And because we sit all day, because people overuse their abdominal wall and try to contract their abdominals too much, it actually creates massive problems in our microbiome um, and our digestion and can lead to a lot of the complications in uh, autoimmune diseases. So what people really need to do is like pull the syringe to get some fresh water in and then compression can be this nice natural oppositional you know push but if you only have compression you're never actually pulling fresh water back through the system fascia kind of holds water and moves it like a sponge or like a syringe but that's another way to think of a sponge is that if you only compress the sponge it's going to end up being dried and and compressed but if you actually allow the water to refill in and take in that then it becomes this like beautiful hydrating, fully um, oxygenating uh, system. And so it could be that you feel a nice sense of um, movement. I think that you probably enjoy uh, jujitsu and you also brought up uh, pickleball. One of the other um, actions that's really important for fascia other than compression and traction of a syringe is called rotation. Rotation is almost like when you wring out a washcloth and get all of the water to come out. And so most of those things that you're talking about require a lot of rotation. And in our general workouts, in our fitness programs, in our um, daily lives, we do not rotate our spine enough. We do not rotate our torso enough. And so we're missing essential nutrients. If you liken movement to food, which is very akin, we've done a really good job of understanding and evolving our concepts of nutritional you know, um, health how foods affect our body, the biochemistry of our, of our bodies. We have not been that critical or that intuitive with our ideas of movement. We've actually marginalized movement to be like, just count your steps. Just go get your burnout on for 50 you know, minutes per day. That's like akin to saying, oh, just eat one big massive 2000 calorie meal once a day. And fascia's like, that does not feel good <laughs> when I, I need to have micro dosing movements and stuff. So we want to get these three elements of traction, compression, and rotation into our bodies every day, but almost every hour on the hour. And so you're probably noticing that when you do these things that you love and you're seeing changes in your body, it's probably because your fascia is, it's more bioavailable, nutrient rich movement that is being available to fascia to have the right amount of tone. So we always think of tone as hardness and tone is in definition. And fascia has a very different idea. It's called biotensegrity, where it takes its form by how it's sharing a balance of tensions. This is why, you know, adipose tissue and cellulite comes to the surface is that you're over tight in some areas and under tight in others. And all of a sudden the tightness pushes your adipose tissue to the surface of your skin and creates a buckling or a cottage cheese type texture. And so what we're trying to do is most people go to the texture and they try to tone it and tone it. It's like, but you actually have to loosen the tone 
right? You have to traction this tissue while you compress this back into the right tensegrity. And so this is how we start to address is a very different approach. For example, fascia is more interested in creating definition in muscles by removing bulky tension and tissues than putting it in. So our modern day, our contemporary way of toning is tighten and tighten and hold and tighten and hold and it's loading. It's almost like adding clay to the sculpture. And fascia comes in and says, actually removing the sculpture, removing what is not, you know, aesthetically beautiful is what's going to leave the quintessential nice aesthetics that you're looking for. And so it does that by remodeling itself based upon load. And that's a whole nother, you know, kind of physics thing that I won't, you know, keep talking about unless you have questions about it. But the way that fascia is asking us to take care of our bodies from inside out is completely and radically different to the point where it's actually opposite from everything we've been taught. Mm -hmm. You touched on some really great things. And when it comes to the rotation, I, this is why I absolutely love swimming. This is why yeah. I absolutely love pickleball because we're rotating our spines, we're sprinting, we're stretching, we're getting some of that compression with using the racket. And we're getting that while we're swimming too. And um, for those of you who have tuned into the show for a while, I was in two pretty rough car crashes and I was, I couldn't do the weight training that I used to do at the gym. So that's why I really leaned into things like swimming, like pickleball, like hiking uh, to make sure that I'm, you know, loading, moving and getting that stretching. And in the, I love to study radiance that this is my jam, you know, how can we have great skin? Okay. Be healthy, use great products, maybe do some rejuvenation, but what's this radiance piece? Why do some people look so much better as they age when they're more mature in their sixties to mid nineties? What are some of these common factors? And I inquired about their types of movement and across the board, these individuals who show up as more beautiful, even though they're more mature and have more signs of sun damage, they, practice flexibility. So they're doing things like yoga and Pilates and stretching. They do a little bit of high intensity, you know, running, sprinting, pickleball is great for that too, but they're not doing like the 50 minute spin sessions. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they're lifting weights. So they're getting, again, some of that compression and the weight bearing exercises, which is really good for your bones. So, it, you know, I, you're absolutely right that all of those different types of movements stretching, cardiovascular, um, and also the weight bearing stuff. These are basically hitting on all of these three components of fascia. And this will have a really great long-term impact. And when it comes to the fascia, and especially the lymph and movement of the face, in my lesson one of my tutorials, and my summer tutorials are happening now, I warmly invite you to register. This is where I take you behind the scenes. And I'm a huge fan of manipulating the muscles and the fascia and the lymph of the head and neck every single time that we're doing our skincare routine. The other thing I really wanted to ask about was, well, there's two more things I want to touch on. I want to touch on posture, but I also want to touch on making love. And a lot of women through, for various reasons are really tight in the hips, probably from sitting too much so in the act of making love, what is this actually doing to the fascia of our bodies for stretching, for movement? I'm really curious about this because we don't want to sidestep that we are all sexual beings and that, you know, this can be a beautiful time to really tune into your body and how things are functioning and noticing if your hips are really tight. And so what happens to the body from the fascia and health perspective when we're making love? That's, that's a really good que uh, question. Okay, so let's back up for just a second and let's talk about our adrenal system versus our endorphin system. And our muscular skeletal system is linked to our adrenal system. It's our getaway car. It is evolved to be able to put us into high flight, fight and flight, get out of, you know, dodge when danger's around. Fascia is the system that is related to the endorphin system, which is supposed to be the antidote to adrenal stress. When you use your fascia, when you move fascia, you're actually eliciting an endorphin-like response. 
One of the problems is, is that we live most of our lives in adrenal states. And I know you talk about this, so you don't have to go that deep into it, but it creates oxidative stress in our bodies. It causes rigidity of structures. All of our muscles and bones start to hold patterns of rigidity. And when your body is rigid, the sensors that are prolific inside of fascia are not able to uh, listen, feel, hear, sense, and actually enjoy the freedom that comes from sexual pleasure. So now we go to pleasure centers. It's a, it's a combination of physical and biochemical responses. Fascia has three times as many mechanoreceptors. And I think in the, um, I think like 10 times as many other sensors like chemoreceptors and nociceptors than any other tissue in the body. Fascia is your sensory organ. It is what is collecting the sensations of your make love making. So you have state and you have body. And when we make love, we need to be in the right state, which is more biochemical. And that will determine the state of our tissues, which is what we are creating our sensations through. Does that make sense? And so most women are locked up both biochemically and then their tissues are unreceptive and you're in a different state and not that all encouraged towards, you know, sexuality. And it can become actually something you're not interested in. Now, this also has one other thing that um, I would like to plug here is that it has a lot to do with where you are in your life as a hormonal system, right? It's not just sensory and it's not just the state of being, but it's like, what are your estrogen, testosterone, progesterone levels? And this can change as you age. As early as 39, perimenopause can come in at, at the age of 29, or sorry, 39. And the deal is, is that fascia is also, the reason I bring this up is that fascia is also extremely, especially for women, extremely sensitive to um, hormone fluctuations. If you notice and you're sensitive in your body already, you probably have noticed that throughout the life of your um, uh, uh, menstrual cycle, you will have periods at which your muscles seize up and tighten and you get sore for no reason or your low back or your digestion changes. And that's because fascia is extremely sensitive and is all over those systems, wrapped as viscera around your organs, into your bladder, into your low back. And so when we take this bigger picture, all of a sudden our sex lives can be complicated, but we can actually address it from a very simple thing. Yes, sure, let's open your hips. It can give you better access, but even more important is that if your pelvic floor is tight and rigid because you're in a state of adrenal stress, you actually don't have your um, tissue in the right place to sense and explore vaginal orgasms right? So tissue that is pulled and torqued do not allow your pelvic floor to be in the place that is possible to be reached and accessed. If you're not in the right state, if you're not in an, ador in an endorphin based place, which is what foreplay really is all about, which is why we need our lovers to be really present and patient with us because it's a state of being that fascia wants to be in in order to have the greatest sensual which has senses in it, the greatest sensual experience. And so for women 35 and older, it becomes even more important that one, you drop in, two, you change your state, three, you have your tissue in a healthy place where you can actually like drop your pelvic floor, have it in the right position, being able to actually be open and comfortable and present in your body. And that also takes a lot of being able to be in right relationship with your lover at the time. I think it's a, it's a full spiritual connection, right? Intimacy is not a physical thing. It's a state of being. It's a spiritual what about thing. With, and so, what about with that? sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. What about for the men? How does like tight, rigid fascia impact the gents? Because as, as, men age with testosterone decreasing, you know, they get kind of soft in more ways than one. Uh, their fascia, their, <laughs> their bony structures, their muscles might get a little bit more rigid and stiff and creaky. So, you know, for male performance, because yeah. 25% of the listeners are guys too, um, yeah. you know, what kind of benefits well, I, do they expect? I think that the, a bigger question for men 
tends to be just we're different species almost, right? <laughs> we're the same species, but we're a little bit different. Um, but I think that that's where it comes to more muscular skeletal stuff. Females can definitely bend, like benefit from like opening their hips and stretching their pelvic floor and allowing for things. But men actually literally when your um, hips and your pelvic floor are too tight, it will restrict sexual performance 100% of the time. I think it has... I, I wish I knew more about male um, hormone cycles. I know a lot about female just because I went through a lot of fertility treatment, which is ironic because you'd think that women should just know this stuff, but it took a really dr dramatic life like um, stress for me to actually pay attention to my body and feel and learn what was happening. So I feel like men in general just need stretching and they know that they need stretching. And when here's, Here's a good way in that's kind of generic because I don't want to speak about something I don't know that much about. And I don't, I just know from a fascial perspective that when fascia is rigid and when there is tightness, hormones don't move as easily and clearly through the body. And so even if you have hormones that are slow or sluggish, or even if your hormones are performing and accurately being supplied, if you have unhealthy tissue, it changes the ability of the body to metabolize and methylate all of these hormonal pathways. And so that's another like, yeah, let's open your hips because range of motion can change the body position and the pleasure that comes from that. But I think that from a bio, you know, chemical level, having really healthy fascia means that your hormones will be more bioavailable to you, whatever, you know, the amount of hormones that you have will be more highly effective. Yeah. And I think it's great just to have this awareness on, on the fascia and the three different things we should be doing for our fascia, which you very eloquently shared. Thank you. Because when we think of our bodies, we think our skin, we think our bones, we think our muscles and we think our organs, but we forget that having healthy fascia really is this intrastellar highway of all sorts of things from uh, electrons, nutrients, metabolites, hormones, all sorts of things. So, you know, moving isn't just to look good. It really is to feel good. I wanted yeah. to, I wanted to ask you a question about posture. So I'm a big yeah, fan cool. of, you know, while you were talking, I was stretching my quads. I'm like, oh, we're doing a an episode here on fascia. I gotta, you know, feel some tension in my yeah, lower back. <laughs> so I'm just stretching my quads behind the scenes here. Um, in the membership, it's it's a container where I go really deep on topics. It's about presenting. You know, the skin stuff is the one on one, the rejuvenation, the tutorials, how to use your products, um, recover faster, dermal rolling, and then the membership is how we show up. And posture is something that I'm such a fan of. When I look at previous pictures and videos of myself from, you know, four or five years ago, when I myself was far too much in the masculine and I didn't feel safe and all these things, I really had to change things up. I was in two car crashes and, you know, all sorts of things. My posture was very masculine, like the way that I would hold my shoulders forward and I would walk. I would kind of like walk like I was tough as this, this like inner protective mechanism to keep myself safe. And then I, you know, was invited to walk on the runway and do a whole bunch of stuff. And I had to learn to walk totally different, um, almost like with, with this bar behind my lower back and my elbows behind that bar too, and keeping the shoulders up and down. And then, you know, once I learned these things, I, I noticed just how different I looked. Our posture and having good posture can make you look immediately more attractive. So when you're working with clients, how does trauma, someone who's had, you know, a number of traumas in their life, how do they carry their shoulders? What is their gait like? And then I'd like to segue, um, just first explain that and then we'll segue into something else. Yeah. So I think the background of fascia that people need to know is that it's your body's primary energetic system and it responds to loading, two types of loading, chemical loading and mechanical loading. Chemical loading is what your body produces through your endocrine functions and endocrine glands and your neurotransmitters and your, and your physical loading is your or mechanical loading is physical loading, the way that you carry yourself, the stresses that are, you know, being afflicted from the outside in. 
And fascia is busy modulating these activities. Now, when you have too much load and not enough metabolism of that load, fascia takes an imprint. Fascia can be stuck in a contracture of hold. Fascia has the ability to contract like a muscle. It's just softer, but it's more prolific in terms of its influence in your body's physiology. So when you have an experience in life, and we all do, right? Like our lives are a series of experiences. How we relate to those experiences are all inside the animation of our tissues. So if you have your heartache, your tissues contract in a way that actually will be gut wrenching, right? Haven't you lost first love and your guts just wrench? That is a visceral and a fascial response that is sending energy through the system to try to metabolize it. So when we look at trauma in the body, the, let's say this, uh, this is a whole nother thing. I'm writing a blog actually on trauma because I think we overuse the word trauma and I think it's misplaced. Um, but what I do want to say is that our emotional lives are in our tissues very much the way that rings are found in a tree that tell our stories that are a narrative of who we are in our flesh. And so when we start looking at the way we posture ourselves based on emotion, you can start seeing similarities. We actually have this wisdom in our culture. I know that you're Canadian and I'm American, but, or United Statesian. <laughs> However, um, uh, we have these wisdoms like she carries the chip on her shoulder or putting your best foot forward or, you know, um, letting things roll off your back right? We have these somatic body wisdoms that actually inversely tell us where our traumas and how they're being expressed. So for example, I was an acting student getting my master's degree and I was having a really hard time with an advanced scene that I wasn't prepared to do as Vu Carré. Um, and it was, it, it was Tennessee Williams, which was a very intense scene. And I couldn't get to this like dramatic crying paranoia state of this character. And I noticed one day that my right side of my body was postured forward while I was giving my dialogue. And I was like, this feels extremely antagonistic and it feels like non-vulnerable because this is my defending side. And so I turned left, I put my left side facing forward and all of a sudden I said two words and I broke into hysterical tears, hysterical tears. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. My, my method of acting was not um, the method, which is very emotionally taxing. It's physical based. I did Stanislavski and it was physical based. Like you take your body posture and you change it and it will change your emotional state. Notice this if you're listening to this podcast. Next time you're in a fight, check which side of your body is forward. Are you standing with your right leg front of you? or your left side in front of you. Check where your rib cage is because we can actually analyze body posture by how fascia contracts and holds memory. And this is what you're saying is that this masculine posture comes very much from, and we're not saying masculine in terms of, these are just qualities that we've assigned to the sex of a male, okay? So we say they are providers, protectors. This is like, you know, anthropological stuff here. It's not a a statement of, of sensitivity to gender in this day and age. But it's saying that these are the emotions that come out in the right side of the body that's governed by the left side of the brain. Your right side represents archetypical male energy. And so whenever you're standing in defense, notice what your posturing is. Notice how fascia has configured itself, even if you're left-handed, which is very interesting and we won't have to go into that. It's not because you're a right-handed person. Sub uh, subsequently, like look at how your stance, how broad, how narrow are you standing? All of these things are an impression and an expression of fascial um, contracture when you're under emotional and psychological stresses. And so that's one type of posturing that is related to fascia um, and, tr and trauma or emotional like Life is kind of traumatic. So I guess in that case, we're all traumatized by life unless we, you know, power up and find our own power to, to live life on life's terms, not the way we want it to or be. Or know when to deload and offload all those stress to the big guy upstairs. That's a, you know how to do it. Yeah, they do. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Very true. Now you wanted to ask another question. I thought you were going to go into posturing in terms of like how to carry yourself the way. Yeah, I'd love to get into posture. Yeah. How much time do you have? Do you have a couple more minutes still? I have a couple more minutes with you. It's really enjoyable. Yeah. Okay, great. It. I really want to talk about posture because posture has like, it's, it's been imperative for neck health, spine health, especially yeah. after car crashes and, but also for me to speak and be on stages and to teach and be received in a professional way as an educator. And you wouldn't want to be listening to me if I was constantly like this, slouch, slouching forward, you know, fidgeting with myself, you know, being kind of like twitchy and, you know, my feet and hands doing weird things all the time. No, that's, that's not the sign of someone who, you know, has their life together kind of situation, right? So I also use yeah. this information when I'm discerning if I want to be friends with someone or if I yeah. want to form a personal or professional type of relationship yeah. with someone. I read, I look at the quality of their physical movements and their posture yeah. because it says so much. If someone's leaning forward, they're insecure and lack confidence, you know, they're protecting themselves. They're twitching, their nervous system shot. They probably have parasites. They probably have, you know, heavy metal toxicity. And if they don't have enough control over their movements, or balance, they can't literally balance their bodies. They do, I, I, I would beg to question that they have difficulty with even balancing their lives. Like the, the, what the mm -hmm. physicality shows of someone is more far reaching than we think. So I'd love for you, Anna, to kind of give us this, this down low on what really good, attractive shoulder posture looks like for pretty much everybody. So for me, for example, bring my shoulders up and back. I engage my, um, my lats and keep my elbows back, which feels really unnatural when you first start doing this, but this opens my chest. So I'm going through life with my heart more forward. I'd love your feedback on that and other things that we can do to adjust our posture. Great. So I'm going to just say something really fast, not to be corrective, but I, to make the listener have a different perspective is that it's kind of a weird thing that we talk about poses in our workouts and posture, because the root of that is to be a statue, right? It's a very static way of thinking. We really want to talk about alignment and alignment through biotensegrity, which is more dynamic. Like there is no best place to be in terms of a held posture? Where should my shoulders be? Every day you're alive, your shoulders should be doing as many things as possible. And they will always find their right placement by how they hang together rather than here's where I'm putting them. Here's where they're shaped. Here's how I'm going to position myself for the workout. The body is so dynamic that we have to start thinking movement, even in our thoughts. So I say that because I want to redefine what is posture by what is alignment and alignment is still not placed. It is not putting my shoulders here. So then fascia always tells us to come back to the heart of the issue. We don't want to try to arrange our parts around the axial skeleton. If you want to change posture, you move your spine first. Okay. So the best way to put your shoulders in the, in the right position is not through moving your shoulders. It's through changing how your rib cage is holding and lifting your chest. It's a central nervous system response rather than a positional shoulder response. Most of us in a high stress state turn to go into a fetal position. It's part of our physiology. When we feel afraid, we roll up and play possum. And so the sit all day posture is the same as the crunches we do, is the same as the protection that we put into our spines. And so the very best thing that you can do for your posture is to arch your spine, to lift your rib cage, to create suspension and levity, which comes back to your thing of radiance. It's like, you cannot shine. You cannot like give the world your all if you are playing possum and curling into yourself. And if your chest is dropped and your abs are too tight, pulling your shoulder backs is going to create just neck pain. You actually want your shoulders to take the lead from your chest. And you can really see this. I'll try to, I'm sitting, but you can see this. We have a tendency to drop our ribs, 
And then we have our head forward and then we're like, oh, we got to fix our posture, pull the shoulders back and down. And then all of a sudden you see the tension around my lymph and around my neck. And all of a sudden it's pulling down on my skin. Okay. So instead of my shoulders, let the shoulders fall because they take their lead from the tension of the spine. You take your spine, you learn how to breathe. And my shoulder went exactly where I need it. I didn't move my shoulder. I'm going to, I don't know if your listeners are going to listen, like be able to see this on video, but if you just take your chest open and lift it up, your shoulders will be where they're supposed to be because they take their lead from how your rib cage is sitting. And so we always go to the heart of the matter. Fascia is a constant wise teacher of if you want to fix your posture and your countenance, the two things you're talking about is your body's posture influences your physiological state. If I don't know if you've ever done this when you were a kid, but like they told you that if you were in a bad mood, take a pencil or a pen and bite on it and it pulls the corners of your mouth back and you smile. And within about 30 to 60 seconds, you start to feel a change in countenance. This is fascia. Fascia is your body's organ of consciousness and its tensions put you into different states of being. And so the same thing is true. If you do this with a pencil in your mouth and it pulls your corner of your, what if you took your lungs and you pulled them into a smile and you lifted your chest and elevated your head and all of a sudden you are not carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You are standing up tall and proud right? We have been taught not to think too much of ourselves and to kind of keep hidden and to, you know, it's like lift your God, uh, sorry, lift your gosh darn chest and lift into your lungs. And that's going to help with your respiratory system. That's going to help with oxidative stress. That's going to actually stretch your vagus nerve and put you into parasympathetic response. Fascia says this work smarter, not harder. People come to me all the time. I'm like, I've tried forever to get my shoulders down and back. And I'm like, no wonder, because you're not doing it from the right place. So it's always this like reminder. If you just lift your chest, you'll never think about your shoulders again. And you start to breathe better. Your digestion is better because you're allowing peristalsis through your organs. So fascia is really intelligent. It says, do one thing that addresses it all. Do one potent thing to address it all. And that changes your countenance. It changes how people experience you. It's a great antidote. If you're having a hard time getting out of a stressful condition, I had this experience not too long ago where I just went back to old patterning and I kind of locked down and I was like, my body started doing its old pattern. And I was like, wait a second, I know better than this. I'm now 46 and I know better. So I went and I just spent three minutes arching over my couch just arching. And I just breathed like 10 deep breaths and I moved my fascia and I moved my fascia into a new dentation, indentation. And all of a sudden my fear went away. My diaphragm released, my low back tension went away and my digestion, I could hear the peristalsis start. And I was like, bam, okay. That's empowerment when you can do one thing and it really gives access to so much potential freedom inside of you. So that's how that's related. I love your passion. And this is exactly why you're back here on the show. You, you've become, you know, the go-to fascia expert here on the School of Radiance <laughs> podcast because, you know, this is such an important topic and what you, what you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, I do some of those things too, right? Like lift the chest, straighten the spine yeah. because yeah, if you're like this, you put your shoulders back, but your head's still tilted forward if you're forward. looking at your iPhone at your waist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that was a great little nuance to add. And I, I just like, I love your use of the word countenance. It's really beautiful. And when we want to look our best, we first need to feel our best. And we want to, when you feel your best, you're going to look your best. It's just, it kind of goes hand in hand. There's, you can't just, you know, show up to somebody to learn uh, in one appointment, how to fix your fascia. This is like a lifelong connection with your body to constantly improve upon and you're just such a wealth of knowledge every time I connect with you Anna you know I give you all these interesting questions and you just you know you always really shine your uh, insights here and so for everybody learning Anna is hosting a retreat in Colorado in August and uh, everybody can learn more about Anna Ray at Anna A-N-N-A 
R-A-H-E.com and also Anna Ray on social media. You have a great social profile. I follow your stuff all the time with your stretches, with your movements and moving is very feminine, right? We want to, we want to be able to be flowing and moving in our bodies. And for men, you know, being strong and being that perfect protector and provider and just having these awarenesses over different parts of your physical component, which end up impacting far more of your your mind your energy and your spirit and then of yeah. course that's your radiance as well the Anna, do you have any that, closing words sorry go ahead. yeah i think hey, that what ahead. i was just gonna say is i was just wanting to say that the greatest gift that fascia can give you is yes health on the inside radiance on the outside um, high frequency, feel better, but it really is a gift to jump into your skin that you're living in and live a deeply embodied life. And I think most of us are being drawn out all the time, distracted. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a disease in and of itself, because when we connect into ourselves is when we really connect to the more subtle energies, the spiritual realities that are surrounding us and the guides that actually are pointing to us and speaking to us. And so fascia as the sensory organ that is collecting every piece of information of your experience, feeding it to the processes of your brain. It is so important to get into your body, to feel, to live deeply embodied. Your body, I say oftentimes, fascia lets your body be your divining rod. It's how you know what is true, right, good, and how to make choices that are empowering to you and loving to others. And so that's what I would just say that if you're a man, stretching is amazing for you and that fascia offers a different type of strength a flexible, agile strength that is not rigid or holding. And for the woman who just wants to let her burdens go and be able to feel better about who she is as she ages, fascia gives you this principles of freedom that give you a sense of joy and a sense of lightness of being. And so there's something there for everybody if you just jump into your skin and start to love the skin that you're in. Hmm. Amen. Very well said. Well, thank you so much, Anna, mm -hmm. for being on the show. And for those of you in the Colorado area, you know, close to Arizona, I know a number of uh, clients and listeners are, are in the area near you. Yeah, I would love to go to your retreat too. Oh, yeah. Uh, not, not this year, maybe next year though. <laughs> but I do look forward to having you back on yeah. the show. So thank you everyone for tuning in thank to you. today's episode right here on the School of Radiance podcast. You can learn more about Anna and I in the show notes of this episode. And of course, head on over to theschoolofradiance.com where you can find my top biohacking recommendations for staying pure, for being our most luminous versions through purification, reducing oxidative stress, like you mentioned earlier, super key, one-on-ones, tutorial, membership. It's all there in one easy place. I'm here to help you become a more conscious consumer in the products that you're using, but also just having more intention with how you're living to be a better human and have a better relationship with yourself and others. And you're going to be leading by example. Have a great day, everybody. And I will see you again right here on the School of Radiance podcast.